Outrocast. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Hey, thank you for taking the time. Uh, how's your morning going? I just got off a conference call, you know, so sorry about the late. No, thank you for doing this. It's really a pleasure. Uh, like my son. My son. <laughs> That's your son. Um, my well, crazy four-month son. <laughs> uh, are, are you still in uh, Tokyo full-time these days, or do you go back and forth between Tokyo and Hawaii? Uh, pretty much uh, stabilized in Tokyo for, the, what, 40 years now, you know? And um, uh, after my my dad passed, passed two years ago, kind of uh played low key not traveling as much as i well it kind of hit the pandemic at the same time so yeah it gave us an excuse not to go home much you know yeah you've been yeah. in japan longer than you've been anywhere else so you're a local you're a native at this point well i feel i feel japanese more than anything else now because of i dream japanese i i speak the language more than any other languages because of speaking Japanese, kind of forgot how to speak a lot of Samoan language that I used to speak. Now it was going to be worse because uh, my dad is gone because I used to speak Samoan to my dad a lot. So hmm. it's all good, you know. That's how long was it we... in living in Japan? How many years did you live in Japan before your Japanese became great and acceptable and it became spoken more than English? Well, um, I think after my second year wow. in Sumo. Yeah, because, well, I didn't have a choice. Everything was 24-7 Japanese. And um, and at the beginning of my career, in, sumo, in the sumo world, when you're, when you're at the beginning of your career, you're like, you're a dirtbag. You do everything. And there's, you don't have to learn the language. The only word you should understand, you, you just have to listen and say the word, hype, hype, hype. It's like, yes, sir, it's... it's it's more. It's worse than the military. You don't have a. You don't. You don't have a, a opportunity to comment or, or to have your. Uh, what you have, you have no way to answer back. Everything is white. It doesn't matter wrong or white. If it says, if something is black and it's white, and he says it's black, it's black. Right. That kind of situation. That kind of. Military like situation sumo, and at least uh, military, you get to go back to your bunk or whatever room you have, but in sumo, you live in a, you live in a life 24 seven. So anybody can get you up at three o'clock and go, Hey, go grab me a soda, man. Right. And kick you out of bed, you know? And so, right. so you had to learn it fast. You know, uh, one of my experiences that the reason why I had to learn it fast is because I remember, I think it was only my third month in sumo and my bosses, my bosses took me out to Ginza, which is a very famous drinking place where you sit down, it's like a thousand dollars. Some of their sponsors, we went out, and I was still, what, um, 18, and, you know, it came in June, 40 years ago, you yeah, know, so, and then he just wanted me to be part of, you know, I guess, showing me off to the new, to the new boy in town with sponsors, you know, he's right. promising and all that shit, you know, before I even know what they're talking about. And I went to the bar, and then, you know, we got the hostess, all these beautiful girls and ladies in the bar, he sat me down for an hour, then he sent me home, home in a taxi. And I remember he giving me 10,000 yen. And I kind of knew Ginza where this place is to where I live uh, during that those days, a Saksabashi, a place called Sak. I know just by riding the taxi wasn't far away. Right. But because I was a foreigner, I couldn't speak any Japanese. When I got into the taxi, I think the boss told the taxi where to take me. But the taxi purposely made it like it was a mistake. It took me like a for a ride. And it was supposed to cost maybe, you know, somewhere between 2,000 yen and less than 3,000 yen. But it ended up costing like 8,000 yen. So I was pissed off because I could have kept the change, right? Right. Of, of 10,000 yen. Right. And this guy, this taxi ripped me off. So ever since then, I made That's it. Hard. I made it. I made it a purpose to like learn how to say it. left, right, straight under the under the train track like Masu Hidari Gado no good to be I you know all these words I, I if I could speak proper Japanese, I was learning all these words so I don't get ripped off again. So you know, that's where the language came in from. And then, you know, picking it up slowly by saying the wrong thing, getting slapped in the head by another 
older elder of sewers and stuff. That's the wrong word to use and stuff. So that's the only way I think I pick up the language. And then I started singing karaoke too. So. Well, yeah, music is an area you found success in. You're not just this renowned sumo champion that's forever in the, the history books. You've made albums. You've been on other people's albums. You've got the charitable foundation. You found success as an actor, as a TV host. It's this great multifaceted entertainment career. And I was wondering mm. if you knew from the beginning that you wanted to do all that or it was just a happy accident. It, it, to be honest with you, it's just a happy accident. But the talent itself, uh, I grew up in, in, in music, you know, church and youth clubs and, and as a grade school, between uh, grades third and high school, I was uh, always a performer, mm -hmm. you know, performing in uh, Polynesian groups and stuff. So I always danced. I led, I led a Polynesian group to contests as a leader in high school. I chanted Hawaiian chant music. I, I sang and when I got into high school, some of the Hawaii best musicians are my classmates. I got a guy named Jeff Rasmussen is probably the, one of the best of top five guitar players in Hawaii. And I had a guy named, um, Analu Aina, who's another classmate. You, you guys all know the world famous uh, Over the Rainbow brother. Oh, yes, yeah, Don. Or, no, his name is brother. He is Kamaka Viva Ole. Oh, the big okay. guy that sings that Over the Rainbow. There's yeah. a, with the ukulele. Well, he's, his bass player is my classmate, Analu Aina. If you look it up. So oh, wow. I was, I was, uh, I was like surrounded by a uh, musical and all the, everything after the sumo career all came just naturally and and it was kind of a natural thing for me too because uh, this is me i don't i didn't i didn't study how to act i just this is just how i am mm -hmm. uh, my friends knew me as a clown in high school you know i was always uh say they're playing sports or doing musical things and and i always was i wasn't a, i could i wasn't a shy guy i was like my dad you give me an opportunity to look stupid or look good it doesn't matter i don't I, I don't think about the outcome. I just think about the opportunity. Sure. Uh, as a big fan of hip hop and a big fan of professional wrestling, my knowledge of Samoan culture, unfortunately, is rooted in all of that. And I heard a rumor that you were related to members of the Booyah tribe. Is that true? Booyah tribe, the, their youngest brother, Gotti, mm -hmm. I got him to join Sumo. And I made them my family. And um, if you go and look at their some of their um, early videos where they're talking, if and you they they say they they've said it many times. I I actually won that um I financed their first album. Wow, I didn't know they're that. In, well, they're in Japan, and they, and that's how we met up. Um, um, my friends at the clubs, the, the guys that had run the clubs, and they came here in Osaka. Mm -hmm. The Buya tribe, they were performers here in Osaka. They had they were dancing in clubs. And, they were dancers. They were known for dancers. They were the yeah. known for rap yet. Um, and then they started doing the rap stuff in the here. And actually, they kind of blown up here in Tokyo more before they even got big outside of uh, Tokyo. Everybody knew. Well, by the time Buya left Japan, all the kids, all the hip hop you see today, the guys that run the biggest shows here, which is huge, are guys that are OGs that actually was copy, the, the copycats of Buya. They had their hair dread. They had the rubber bands on and they danced and the hip hop that you have today, the OGs, the aircraft from Buya. And they all, and that's how I related to the hip hop world too today. Skip, I talked to all the guys that, you know, when, when Red got, when Godfather passed, they all called me and, and we, and they had made, they, they made tributes here in Japan too to them. Buya has a great following here in Japan. So, yeah, so uh, that's where we, that's, that's where we were related. You know, I still talk to Gotti who lives in Vegas and stuff. Mm -hmm. They're like my brothers. I treat them like my brothers. And we have, we have so much memories together here in Japan. The wrestling side is, is I guess, you, you like wrestling too. The Kishi yes. and uh, the, the uh, former great Kokina, mm -hmm. uh, Yokozuna. If you go at his very early career, I remember him calling me one day. He was at the K.O. Plaza Hotel here in Tokyo, Shinjuku. He yeah. said, hey, it's, it's so late. I got to talk to you. I said, what's up, brother? I got to talk to you. Um, at the time, WWE was ready to sign him, and they had this gimmick of being a sumo guy. I thought, yeah, easy. What do what, what you need from me? Yeah, I just need some outfits. So his first outfits he wore on ring was mine. Wow. I, 
I had no idea about any of that. Are, are you connected to the Anawai family, which he's from? Very connected. I performed at the, the, their grandfather's church when I was younger. I, well, because I toured um, as a, I think I was still like 15 or 16. I performed in San Diego, San Francisco, and in LA. And their San Francisco church is actually the Anawais. And um, and uh, Anawai, we're very close. I, I talked to the Kisha pretty much. In fact, I just got off a messenger with him. I'm hmm. trying to get um, trying to get everybody to send messages because I'm celebrating 40 years in Japan. So I'm getting some uh, shout outs from all my friends and families that I, I, I kind of relate to and I, people that inspire me or kept me in track of my career and stuff. So I, I, I just I just been doing that all morning and stuff. So I'm getting off some conference calls and stuff. So if you know those people, then that means you know Brother D from Dawn Raid Entertainment in New Zealand. Exactly, exactly. Brother D, uh, Kapisi, Kapisi, all those guys I, I used to, and, and that's where we connect with all the fighters too. Hunt, uh, Sefo, yeah. all these guys I used to take out all the time. I took out when we were fighting here and stuff. I still connect with, uh, with Hunt and Sefo to the internet. And when I went to New Z uh, Sydney, um, how to uh, what you call Mark? Mark took care of me, drove me around, and yeah, so I'm connected with you know anything Polynesian that comes to Japan. I I want to get on it and try to hook up with the with the Polynesians. Uh, we have a huge following of Hawaiian music, Hawaiian mm -hmm. dance, but the fighting is another is another place. And we just had another Samoan kid who's half Samoan. He's he's Otake. He's from Vegas. He's a basketball player. He just joined a professional league here. And so, you know, people, that, we all connected. Uh, he's uh, connected. So uh, Buya Tribe, God, he calls me, hey, you got to take care of my nephew. I, first thing I do, I connect with him. In fact, I just got off the phone with him yesterday. And, oh, uncle, uh, uh, um, can I come over to the office? And, yeah, come over. So you try to keep the, the Polynesian connection, you know. So you're so a I cultural ambassador. That's what I'm learning right here. You're you're a connector. <laughs> I would love to be called that. All my friends tell me that because every time no one hangs out together until I come to Hawaii and everybody connects and we all go out and some, and they're like, I go, what the heck is going on? You guys don't see each other. Can I cuss on your, is it okay to cuss? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I, I always go, what the fuck's going on? You guys live on the same damn island and you guys don't see each other. Yeah, yeah. that's the come When you come home, everybody's so happy because you get everybody to come, come together and stuff. Same here. Same here too. I have my little... Japanese family here when when I need help, just phone calls and people be flocking in to to participate in all my events and stuff. You know, my office is is I only have like two three people in my office, but we big we have huge events that we work on. And people tell me how big is your company? Me, my wife, my secretary, <laughs> and, and then we have a part time kid who's a I'm kind of groom right now. He's only twenty one and he's learning learning how to you know work with people and stuff. And just teaching them basic. Uh, basic things about life, you know, and the way you work with people is, is, is the way you have to relate them, good or bad. You just got to get the message over what you need from them and what they need from you. you mm -hmm. They don't have to be the best person in the world, but when it comes to business, you have to learn that it's business. So that guy can be an asshole, but he, he, would, he would have the perfect skills of what you need in your business. So that's how it is. It, it just you, you, and I always tell them, well, you just place them in your ABC course. If for for business is A, but to private relationship C. So you don't really have to see them on a private basis. You can see them doing work because Otagai, which is it's 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 a give and take. He's he's getting your skills and you're getting his skills. So you know it's it's a plus plus. So never mind, never mind the attitude. You can uh, the attitude can be thrown out after business. It doesn't matter, you know. So stuff like that, you got to learn because we live in a world where people are two-faced sometimes. Some people are just naturally nice. Some people are just actors, you know, you know, trying to make that, trying to make that dollar, man, you know, which is normal. I mean. So it's wonderful to see somebody like you able to be themselves and able to bring everybody together and not be in competition with everybody. You're not trying to take anyone's work. You're trying to get everyone together. And if they put you into the work, that's great. Exactly. And, and my thing is, I know my skills. I know what I'm good at, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not, I'm not trying to take away anything because I don't, I don't want to put myself in a situation where I'm going to struggle to try to do something when I know somebody I know can do the shit way better than I do. Yeah. You know what I mean? I rather pay for that service and then try to bust my brain, you know, 
Totally, totally. Maybe if I was 20 or 20, late, uh, late 20s, yeah, maybe I would bust my ass. But when, I'm, I'm turning 60s within, within a year or so. So, brother, you got to take your life, man. Take it easy. Um, stick to the skills that you're good at. And um, take, it at, take it at a little slow stride. You know, never mind. You're not 30. You're not 40 anymore. Um, be, you come into that day. And, and I enjoy life. I'm just very grateful and very humbled with the life I had, you know, coming from a, a Samoan family that immigrated to uh, in, to Hawaii in the, in the mid fifties. My dad, I give him so much credit, bless him in heaven, him and my mom, you know, and you know, even people like that, you just learn from just hard work. You know, my dad's my best, my dad's best line is just shut up and work. You know, wait for the outcome. Right. You know, if you just do what you have to do, the outcome is going to have it's going to have it then. Same thing when I came to Japan. He told me to shut up and work. Don't worry about <laughs> the <up> work. <laughs> uh, so uh, speaking of shutting which up, which is true. It, it, <laughs> speaking of shutting up and working, though, how did you meet David Lee Roth? I couldn't figure out how that happened because out of nowhere, people who went to his YouTube channel started seeing him at a sumo match with you. You popped up in his Tokyo Story movie, and it was like, how did he find Konoshiki? <laughs> Oh, I, I see you in depth into uh, researching me, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it, well, it's, I, I know you're a music guy, but I didn't think of you as, hey, that's a Van Halen fan. I was just wondering how that happened. I, I, the funny thing is, uh, him himself is, is a huge Japanese lover. Mm -hmm. And he and the place that he's, uh, the, actually the department, apartments he was renting was a place where I used to go and help that company do volunteer work. We used to went because it, um, remember the big earthquake that happened like 11 years ago? Yes. And that's why I, I developed a group of people that came out and uh, went and we cooked for like 25,000 people. And it's all friendship and stuff. So that was the base of where I used to go and gather people to uh, develop ways to uh, go out and cook for people. And we started a Coney Santa project and he was in the lobby. And it wasn't me that approached him because I didn't notice him. He didn't have the long hair anymore. He cut right. his hair. And he don't want to talk to me. And he stopped me and said, hey, Cody Shiki. And he said it really like real Japanese. He has a great accent. And that's why you know he's an artist. He's a singer. Yeah. Even at the Japanese accent, he says it really clear as a Japanese accent. So I sat down. Hey, nice to meet you. Real, real open. And I sat down and he knew the stable I was in. And from there, we became real, real close. He, he kept in touch with me. And I thought, let's take you to Sumo. We took to Sumo, took you to Sumo Stable, went to a couple of friends' dinners and stuff. But he's very, very, um, very intelligent man. Oh, yeah. I mean, very, very intelligent. People don't know this guy. He, can, he talks a lot, and which is makes him a perfect iPod cat person. And he's so funny. He got so much energy, man. He was here, he was a deshi, means he was a, he was a student, one of the best uh, swords. You know how they sharpen swords, the yes. samurai swords? That's what he was doing here in Tokyo. Uh, I've heard that he was sharpening swords, he was learning Japanese, he was learning um, penmanship or, or calligraphy. And I think there was a fourth thing he was learning at the same time while making a movie. And while still in Van Halen, I didn't understand how he was doing all that at the same time. In fact, he was actually, he was based here in Tokyo when he was doing that. He was here like maybe close to six months, I think. But he went, he flew back and he was telling me how, how the business is, all the merchandise and stuff. He does he, everything, he told me. And then, and he says, you got to, you got to merchandise your market to where you go. When you go to Texas, you cannot market the way you market in LA because the groove is different. The, the movement is different. The right. looks are different. And like, he's, he's like, I was just listening to this guy tell, man, this guy knows what he's doing. And he said, well, we live in a technology world. I don't have to be there to do anything anymore. I can do it out of my computer now. So I, I was amazed with him. Um, and I love his videos, the one he does on the train, on the train dancing and stuff like that. Yeah. And then his story about his whole families are doctors and stuff. He's yeah. the only one that came out musical. And he always went across the train, train track to hang out with the blacks. That's, the, that's where his groove and his, his like really a soulful dancing comes from.
when you're hanging out with them, do you talk about music at all? Or do you talk about everything except music? It's it's more him asking me questions about sumo. Oh. He, he's so in, he's he's so into the history of sumo and stuff. And then when we did the movie, he called me out, "Hey, Koniski, I have this little team uh, movie thing that I want to do. You want to be? Oh, well, just let me know if I have time." And they tell, "But I need some guys that look kind of yakuza." Can you get all this guy? So the guys you got in a video is, is friends of mine. So I got them to be part of the video. But I didn't know. I just took them. I said, no problem. Let me just let me know where to go and get, let's do it. And then I went and done it. But I didn't know that was going to be part of the tour. That was it. People was watching and people would call me, hey, I saw you at Tokyo Dome. I saw you at Osaka Dome. And telling me, I, I, I cannot believe you're part of Van Halen. I thought, what Van Halen? You're part of the movie. Oh, oh, that movie, I, I forgot all about it. But that's why. I, speaking with some of the filmmakers, they told me there was no script for that. No script, no script. <laughs> he, so, he, just, he, he just tells me, I want you to say this, I want you to do this, oh, got it, let's do it. Wow. But, uh, you know, yeah, that's, no script. that's not the only acting you've done because we've seen you on television a lot or, or at least read about you being on television a lot. So it's this now huge career where I'd have to imagine that a lot of people don't even know you were a sumo wrestler because they've been hearing your music and they're like, wait, he also was an athlete? Yeah, so well, started off at 18 um, from high school, the powerlifter, and I played American football. And um, after joining sumo, 16 years of career, um, the acting stuff just came naturally. I was very uh, lucky to have opportunity to be in a uh, Tokyo Drift movie, yeah. which I, I totally forget because when you shoot a movie, they don't shoot a movie until like a year later. Yeah. And, and I was busy as hell myself. After my sumo career, I was like only shooting commercials in Japan. In fact, that's how I got all my money is just freaking, I was doing basically all the huge corporate commercials. I did Santori, Sanyo, you name it. We did PlayStation. I mean, huge, huge uh, corporate. And I think I was one of the first so-called like athlete, celeb Japanese guy that I actually uh, negotiated all my own contracts and I didn't go cheap. I went, I went, yeah, I, I, I'm, this is what I work. And like, they're like looking at me, what the, well, you like it or not, you got to take it. And you know, it's perfectly, perfect timing because Japan was still in a bubble, right? That's why they were just throwing money away, man. I remember flying, they're flying me from Hiroshima to Narita, get me on a private jet, fly me to Saipan, go to Guam and fly me back on a, you know, just to shoot commercials. Like, man, this guy's spending some, some dollars on this huge plane and there's only seven of us on the plane, you know? And I was like just shooting commercials, like we, from retiring in 1997, I, 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 I officially left the association 97 of September. And already I was, I was already uh, shooting commercial without them knowing me commercial. And I already started a company called KPA Inc. Kurishki mm -hmm. Power. So I already was shooting commercial uh, five, six years into my retirement. That's all I did, man. Thank God. I, they made me richer than I was in 16 years. I tried to kill myself in a solo career where they live. You get paid a salary, man. It's crazy, you know. But you know, I don't take anything back. I would do it the same way I did. But you know, like my dad said, just do the work. Uh, you, and yeah, just shut up for work. And, uh, you did that career path ten years before Bob Sapp could have. Yeah, you and then Bob Sapp, the, all everything else that came in is all like you know, all this pride and um, the K one thing that actually they're the one that helped UFC to get where they had to there. Originally in Japan, you know. All you see now, the body too, and all this stuff was huge in Japan way before UFC came. Right. Some of the first fighters, the first UFC, there's an extra ex sumo guy inside there, Taylor, Taylor Wiley, the guy that got kicked in the face and bust his teeth. Yeah. That's an ex sumo guy. And then, then you have like guys like uh, my my schoolmate Anthony Noe, who's a legend, Egan and Anthony Noe from Hawaii, and he's a legend here in Japan too. People, and we. We, we, we stay at stay touches stuff. So cool. Yeah, man. Well, my, my last question, because you've been very generous with your time, is 
What's coming up next? What should we be looking out for besides the celebration of your 40 years in Japan? Is there another single or an album coming soon? What can you tell me? Uh, we, we just dropped a cover album on March 9th to celebrate 40 years in Japan. And I'm looking more to uh, the, really, the thing that I really want to do is actually, uh, uh, actually produce shows, you know, bring some great shows, bring some great artists together to uh, collaborate with artists here. I think that make a good match. Actually, that's, I want to be on the backside of things more than, I always told my wife this, I was always told everybody, but shit, every time I try to do something, I create something. There's no bigger name than Konishki. So, you know, I'm sure. forced to put myself on stage, which to be honest with you, I don't even want to be on stage. I want to be a backup singer more than anything else. But, you know, I love what I do. And if, if it's needed, you know, it's simple shit. Well, why try to dig a hole when you already have the, you, you already know the answer. You And then, and it's, everything is about advertising. And, you know, I'm just humble that everybody knows Konishki, but at the end of the day, that's how, I'm trying to get away from being in the front of the stage. I try to want to go more, play in the backside and try to create events. I've been creating all these events myself for the past years already. Huge events, you know? Mm -hmm. But I, at the end of the day, I still have to be the closer because I'm a bigger name. Right. You know, I hate to say that, but it's... I have to be honest, because even if I bring a big artist from Hawaii, the biggest artist named to, from Hawaii and play on the stage, if you compare how they know me here in Japan and know that artist here in, in Japan, it's, it's, it's day and night. Konishiki has been on TV for the past 20 something years. I'm still on TV. We're doing this. I've been doing this children's show for 20 years called Nihongo de Asobo. And he's one of the most famous kids. He's like a Sesame Street show. And I've been doing it for 20 years. You know, I come with a character called Konichan. Yeah. But I'm looking forward to be more like a, a producer and in, in, in putting great shows together, uh, help some of the artists here, young artists, to cre help them create ways to do venues, you know, more venues for them. And, you know, because I know it's a hardship. After this pandemic, uh, I lost a, a few friends. Sure. You know, and they, they're just artists. They're just musicians, period. They don't know how to do anything else but being a musician, which is normal. That's, that's their bread and butter. So if you take that away, it's like taking away the spoon from their hand, you know, and some of them actually took their lives with because of that. And I and, and I believe this is this happened all over the world, not only in Japan, because yes. some artists is just artists, you know, and you can't take that away. They don't know how to do anything else. They don't they don't know how to go and try to work for Uber or drive Uber or they cannot do that. They've been doing singing or playing guitar or drummer for, for their whole life. That 150 bucks or 200 dollars gig money they have Friday, Saturday, Sunday is what they leave off, you know? So I hope I can find a way where I create help all the young upcoming artists and artists that I, I know where it's a normal thing for them to play music every weekend, you know, try to connect people and, and try to grow uh, having people to listen to more li live music. I think live music has to come back, you know? And, you know, and that's one thing a good about live, live music is you get to relate to people, you know? And that's what I love about stage. I sit there, I talk, I joke, you know, and I, I get emotional sometimes because I'm very grateful with the opportunity to have it. You got to feel what you have. Man. And, you know, musicians that do that every night, every weekend, I know they're all emotional because God has given us a talent that we, we live off, you know. And so if I can actually um, keep a platform open and help, help push this platform where everybody can enjoy upcoming artists or artists that are already here, here in Japan, and then, you know, maybe out of the year, two or three times a year, try to put a good event together where I can bring artists from Hawaii and collab collaborate with artists, because people love Hawaii here. You know, if I can find a way to collaborate, stuff like that would be beautiful. And I'm actually coming out with my book, finally, mm -hmm. in October, which is something I'm looking forward to. And really talk about the life behind the scenes. People know about me because you can find it on Wikipedia, but they don't know what goes to the man's mind, right? trying to overcome stuff, you know? And, you know, a lot of this stuff, actually, basically, I'm trying to, and the funny thing about the whole book is, like, what the hell did this 18-year-old kid think of when he left Hawaii? Because his parents was against him. He had no idea what sumo was, had no information on what Japan was as a country, and he just went. So I'm trying to, the question was, what the hell did you think when you were 18? What made you do this? And at the end of the day is, how did 
this four cultures actually create this monster, Konishki, because it's a Samoan kid born and raised in Hawaii, which is American culture. Mm-hmm. When I walk out of the door and go on the street, go to school, it's American. But when I came home, it's all Samoan culture. Right. We weren't allowed to speak English in the house because my mom couldn't speak English. So culturally in the house, we, we lived our life real Samoan culture, which is very seniority. You got to listen to your older brothers. And then the funny thing, when I came to Japan, I came to Japan as a sumo wrestler, which is a culture of sumo in Japan. It's up with two, two different cultures. So yeah. like it's four cultures that I try to see where I can relate four cultures and similarities of a Samoan culture and sumo culture where it helped me get to where I had to there. So it's very interesting the way I looked at the book and it's, I'm not trying to write like um, what you call like a diary kind of thing. It's more like a story of this kid who had to grow up in four different cultures and found out like the shit that I was getting beat up for in the house when I was younger is the same thing that I was getting fucking hit in, in sumo because everything is seniority. So I was talking back to my brother. My brother punched me in the face and I cried. And then I go to my run to my dad and said, he punched him. I said, why did you talk back to your brother? Same thing with Sumo. I go, this guy hit me. You know? Well, you cannot talk back to a senior guy, even though he's younger than you. If a guy joined before you, he's, he has seniority. And, you know, little stuff like that, that people don't real, to realize, but you can relate to it. And that's why my attitude about, bro, just don't try to force anything. If you know somebody that can do things for you better than you, let them do it, you know. <laughs> and if you, and brother, I'm not saying anything new. If you go back to history and listen to all these guys that created App and Microsoft, you know, they, they were just a guy who created everybody else. He put everybody together and Apple was created. Yeah. You know, that's what he did, right? He, yeah. You, you find the smartest people, you get them together, and somebody kind of leads them. But you also said it before, and you're saying, you know, yeah, all you listen actually, and do the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the attitude of being a leader is very important. You can bring them together, but how do you get them to connect? So the leader is very important that he has to show them that he has confidence in them. Everything he's doing is 100%. He's going to back them up. And that's what created Apple to me. And, and I look at that all the time. I said the same thing. Brother, just, just do what you're good at. Don't try to fucking do more than you can handle, you know? Because once you get the pieces together, and I see some of the best creations we see at two, in the world today, it's, it's different minds coming together and creating things today. And, and that's how the world is so like the genre in music too. Is there's no genre anymore. You know, everything's mixed up. People are collaborating, mm-hmm. featuring on each other's music, which is a great thing. You know, music should be uh, collaborating, you know? Well said. Well, I look forward to that book. I look forward to reading it. Hopefully there's an English version of it. If not... <laughs> no, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in every language. I'm going to awesome. work on being on every language. And uh, we might be having a sumo tour in November, or if not next year. I uh, just wanna, don't want to really push it, but I've been requested to do a lot of sumo tours because I did a sumo tour right before the pandemic. We did Seattle, Los Angeles, and New York. Great success. Sold out. And um, they still, the promoters in the U.S. wants us to do something. But uh, let's see. You see what we do. It might be a perfect timing because my book would be out and do a sumo tour. Sumo tour where well, I can do some book up, get my book out there and people to read it. It's funny, it can relate to everybody, brother. Thank you for your time. Hope to see you in New York. Thank you for your time and continued success as wish to you. Thanks, man. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you for having me, brother. Thanks. Take care. Yeah, thank you, bro. Outrocast.